Welcome back to session 25 on beams. In this part, we're going to discuss indeterminacy. And we'll be looking at situations where you have more reactions than might be necessary to statically solve a particular problem. So let's, let's get into the difference between statically determinant and indeterminate systems. In a determinant system, the number of reactions equals the number of equilibrium equations, right? So typically we're talking about three equilibrium equations. Some of the forces in the x direction, some of the forces in the y direction, and the sum of the moments about a particular location on the structure. For indeterminate systems, it's the case where we don't have a determinate system. So the number of reactions is greater than the number of equilibrium equations. And there's a term, degree of indeterminacy, which is the number of reactions that we can remove to get to a determinate system. So in the past, I've emphasized thinking about you know, the number of equations and the number of unknowns that you have, and then looking at it from that perspective, I think it's actually a little bit easier to think about, okay, what, is, what does a determinant system look like and what can I remove such that I will still not have the structure flopping over, <laughs> okay, uh, still be statically and still statically determined or in, in place, right? So let's let's talk a little about this in terms of some examples. Here, this is a determinant system, okay? And maybe one way to think about it, is it a determinant system? Okay, this pin-pin configuration one is that we've solved it a number of times now, or configuration, so we just have two pins. But if I removed one of the supports, one of the the reactions either at a or b what's going to happen this is going to flop over okay and it's not going to be a system in statics it's going to be something that you might want to solve in dynamics all right so a determinant system can also be thought of as okay what's the minimum number of uh, or the system with a minimum number of reactions such that it doesn't flop okay there's got to be more technical terms for that but that's let's just go with that right now Okay, so here the equations that we'd be using with equilibrium might be summing at A, the moments, along with summing forces in the x and y directions. And with these types of systems, when we discuss degree of indeterminacy, okay, we often do keep in this this normal load or this axial load along the beam but it, it ends up being zero and so it just kind of knocks out the summation of the forces in the x direction right and so often we're more interested in, okay what's happening in the in the y direction with the forces and what's happening with the moments but here we can say okay there are three reactions one two three even though rx is equal to zero and we have three equations describing the equilibrium of this system. And we can solve for all these reactions and we're done, okay? And in this case, the reactions are, are forces, okay? There's no reaction moment, foreshadowing. Now let's take a look at an indeterminate system that's similar to this, okay? What is different? Well, now instead of having a pin on this side, it's a, a wall, a fixed wall constraint. So in this case, if we draw out the reaction forces and the moment, okay, ML now, we have four reactions, Rx, ML, Ra, Rb. And we only have three equations. Okay. So what happens, we can't solve for all, I mean, Rx is equal to zero, so we really have three and two. We can't solve for all these unknowns, ML, RA, RB. Okay. And 
if we remove one of them, so like if we go from this fixed wall constraint to the pin constraint on this end, that would be what we had before and it would become, de become determinant. If we removed the RB on this side, okay, then, then yeah, it, um, it would also become determinant. Then it's a cantilever beam, right? So just take that away. Okay, um, how you remove RA <laughs> uh, and keep ML, okay, that's maybe a little bit tricky to do, but you could imagine this end somehow being suspended and then you have the ML there, but that's not really a system that we think about too much. But once again, the principle is remove one of the constraints in this case, and you can get to a statically determinate system. So this one that we say is indeterminate to first degree. And we can also say we could remove one of the reactions, okay, to become determinate, right? So um, we, we would be able to do that. And, and in fact, um, we're really looking at ML, RA, RB. Uh, if we were to remove RX, um, that wouldn't really help us so much with figuring out ML, RA, and RB, right? So it's, we're removing one of these. Okay, let's go on to another example, which involves a few different configurations. And we ask ourselves a question, how many degrees of indeterminacy do we have for each of the following scenarios or systems? So for this one on the left, we ask ourselves, how do we convert it to a determinant system? Well, what do you, what do you think? Um, uh, probably remove, you know, a right or a left wall, because then it'd just be a cantilever beam. So we could remove a right or a left wall, and we get a situation that looks like this. Now, how many reactions are associated with a wall? Well, two. We have both the moment and also a force. So we could say that this system up here okay, has two degrees of indeterminacy so that we could get to a statically determined system like this one by removing a wall. Okay, same question for this middle system. All right, how do we convert it to a determinate system? Well, one way it would be to just remove all of these supports, okay? Uh, we, we could do that, all right? And so this would be that's perfectly valid. And there's a constraint associated with each one of these is a you know, force. So we have three degrees of indeterminacy. Another way to maybe do it, right, would be to say, oh, I'm actually gonna remove this wall. Okay, constraint um, is my, if I just remove the wall constraint, is it still indeterminate? Well, why? Yes, it is, because we still have one unnecessary constraint here. So if we remove the wall and remove this one, for example, or remove the wall and remove this, okay, one of these, anyone would do, then we would get ourselves into a situation where um, we're once again removing three reactions okay so once again three degrees of indeterminacy come over here we got to figure out how to convert this system to a determinant one well what what can we do um we could remove one okay and they'll still not flop around could we remove two yeah we can remove two and it still won't flop around if we remove three oh it's going to flop around okay so maybe this is a configuration or this plus this one on the right, right? Um, there, there are you know, different combinations that we can do here. Um, and this one will have two degrees of indeterminacy, okay? So this is an approach to figuring out how many degrees, how indeterminate is the system? And it's useful not to just think in terms of the equations, but also in terms of the structures now themselves and we have some experience right with solving for 
beams or other systems that don't flop around. They're not dynamic, they're static. Now, we've determined the degrees of indeterminacy, and that's nice, but how do we solve for these unknown reactions? Do we just throw up our hands and give up? Of course not, okay? What we have are a couple of different tools. One is method of integration, which is kind of what we've been doing, but now we have an unknown, and we'll talk about how to do this. We can also use superposition, okay? So let's, let's start by looking at indeterminate systems generally, all right? And I don't have a very technical way to go about this, but what I'll say is keep on plugging, all right? Keep on swimming, like Finding Nemo or something like that, okay? You just gotta keep on plugging at it when you're doing integration. And what does that mean? It means, okay, use boundary conditions, use continuity conditions to attempt to solve for one or more unknown reactions that you that we might have in a problem. Okay. So let's let's look at this example in, in detail. Here we have a um, distributed and load applied to this system with a fixed wall on one end and a a roller on the right. Now how could we make this, you know, first, is it indeterminate? And the answer is, well, yes, okay, because I have an unnecessary, one unnecessary constraint. I could remove this one at B, or I could convert this wall to just a pin, and either one of those would make it uh, a determinate system. So you don't always have to do this, actually, when you start solving these problems, but it's not a bad idea okay, to, to solve or to write out the equations for external equilibrium, okay? And again, this will just confirm we can't really, we have uh, three unknowns, M, L, R, A, R, B, and only two equations. So we are not going to be able to solve for, um, for all these unknowns. So we're gonna need to use some boundary conditions and continuity conditions and we can, I mean, we talked about constitutive relationships, we talked about um, geometric compatibility, we talk about uh, constitutive relationships, right, where we know something about the displacement. And um, when we have like an EIV, right, when we're talking about EI second derivative of displacement with respect to X, as we're going along the beam, right, look, there are material properties that we're using, E and structural properties that we can use, okay, to be able to solve for these um, un unknown reactions. And this is not dissimilar from what we did were over-constrained systems or indeterminate systems with axial loading, right? We had to introduce the elastic modulus or we had to introduce some type of stiffness parameter in order to be able to solve for the unknown reactions. So um, here we go. We're going to take a slice, okay, and this is the method of integration that we used before, and we're going to solve for the moments, right, because it's often easier to only do two integrations, so if we have an equation for moment, internal moment, okay, so we're even skipping internal shear, but we're just doing internal moment, and why are we skipping internal shear? Well, if we do the sum of the moments here at this open face, boom, right there, then V is going to contribute no moment, okay, or will not contribute any moment. So we can rearrange things. And what's disturbing here, of course, is that we have uh, the internal moment and we have an RB, right? And this is an unknown. Okay? That's kind of disturbing because often if we have, a well, if we have a determinant system, everything would be kind of a known quantity that we'd be integrating on. It's okay, though, because RB is a constant. So we can do the integration without too much difficulty, but we then need to apply boundary conditions to be able to figure out what RB is in the end. So here is our equation for uh, the moment, uh, EI second derivative of V with respect to X. And we just plug that in. We integrate once and we get something that we related to the slope and uh, we have a C1 and we integrate again. And now we have uh, an expression for displacement and we have a C2. So what boundary, which boundary conditions do we want to use here? Well, at X equals zero, we can say that the displacement, so, you know, I, in this case, it's kind of important, but we're going to say that X is the right, OK? 
okay, coming from the right, as you see here. So when x is equal to 0, uh, displacement is equal to 0, right? And that's because it's on a roller, so that's fine. That makes this kind of nice, that c2 goes to 0. When x is equal to l, so we're going from the right to the left, we're going all the way over here to a, okay? We have a wall, and we can say that the slope is equal to 0 there. So when we plug in x equals l to this second equation, right, we get what we have here. Okay, so now we're, we're going from the right side to the left, plugging in L, and now we say this has to equal to zero, so we need to figure out what C1 should be to make it zero. C1 um, uh, is an unknown. RB is also an unknown. So once again, we're like, ah, we have two unknowns in, in one equation. But we can also say at x equals L, the displacement is equal to zero. Like over here, it's this equal to zero. So now we plug in x equals L into this same equation, and we have another equation, another expression with two unknowns in it. Same unknowns that are here, RB and C1. So now we can do a little bit of algebra, and in this case, we're um, multiplying uh, this green equation by three to get this expression. Why? So that we can knock out one half RB L squared and one, RB, one half RB L squared. So we do that, combo, do a little combo, and we get an expression that only has C1 in it. So now C1 can be written as the following. All right, not the prettiest expression, okay? a little bit complicated, but okay. What do we do to figure out what RB is? Well, we plug it back in, right? So we plug c1 or not rb but we plug c1 right into here and we can figure out what an expression is for um for our uh, equation right or we can uh let's see yep that and um uh and and, and so we're off or we could plug uh c1 into this equation right and, and we're off either way so now we can write out what RB is. RB is equal to 3 eighths W naught L. We can go back all the way to external equilibrium and say RA is equal to 5 eighths W naught L. And we can go all the way back to this external equation to figure out what NL is, okay? And so um, we're able to solve this indeterminate system by combining uh, external equilibrium, internal equilibrium, and our relationships for beam bending uh, with the moment. Now, you're like, oh, well, is this just useful for calculating forces? What if I want to know displacements? Well, now that we know all these constants, C1, RB, RA, ML, but really just we need two of them. We need C1 and, say, RB. We can go back here, all right? And we know that C2 is already equal to zero as well, but we can plug in RB, C1, and we can figure out displacement along the beam. We can figure out the slope along the beam, okay? So um, this is a, a powerful technique. A lot of algebra, though, using the method of integration. So now you have an opportunity to use the method of integration to um, go ahead and, um, and solve this, this question that you have here, okay? And yes, it is over-constrained. In fact, it's got two degrees of indeterminacy, as we can see here. Right? If I remove one of these walls, I'd be fine. And so um, we, have to, we have to tackle it, um, keeping that in mind. Now, method of integration is one technique for handling these indeterminate beams. Another technique, and this is not the only technique, these are not the only techniques, by the way, but another technique is to use superposition, okay, which we were just discussing. And this is uh, a useful and sometimes simpler way than doing um, the integration that we were just discussing, and so and may hopefully a little bit less algebra, still algebra, but hopefully less. So what we essentially are saying is that we're going to add tabular results from beam bending examples together, okay, and we're going to satisfy boundary conditions. So let's take a look at this problem, okay? Um, we can say that 
I could remove this constraint on the right and then have some calculated displacement here. I don't the one. So if we remove this constraint, right, it's going to sag on the right side. <clears throat> it's going to go down. And I can counteract that sag, okay, by applying a force P on the right, because that's all this constraint is doing. All right, this looks familiar. Right, yeah, this this is familiar, right? This is kind of that force method <clears throat> that we were using for axial bars many moons ago. Maybe not many moons, many days ago. So um, here we have a situation where this has got to be, this place on here has to be equal to zero. So if this is going down, I can say delta one minus the delta two here with a force being applied at the end is equal to zero. So we can say that delta, and we're and there, and um, uh, and if we're interested in knowing what the displacement is, for example, here at the middle, or we're not even interested in displacement at the middle, all right? We're interested in, in solving for P, right? What we can do is we can write out um, expressions. So this would be for the middle, all right? Or we can write out expressions for the delta one and the delta two, all right, from our tables. And then we can set them equal to zero and we can solve for what P is. W naught is a known. Okay, that's a known, but P would be the unknown. And so once we've solved for P, then we can plug it in and figure out what the displacement here is at the middle. So um, delta one is this, delta two is this, and we, we plug these two together, all right, as you see here. And that's how we solve for P, just like that. Whoops, I didn't mean to go very quick. And now if we want to solve for the middle, okay, we can come over here like that. All right, so this is a nice, you're like, oh, this is really nice. No, no integration, okay, intuition, I agree, <laughs> okay? Methods of superposition can be quite nice for solving these situations with indeterminate beam bending problems but of course this this pen this depends on having some tables already in place okay um to be able to to do that solving here's another question all right um here we have a, a system with p acting in the middle all right and it's got a fixed fixed uh conditions or it's a fixed fixed beam and um in this case, right, we need some tables or we need some additional information. So what I'll say is a hint, it might be useful, okay, to use the following configurations. And then the question is, what is the displacement at the middle of the beam, all right? So this is a question that you get to work on. And um, after you've done that, all right, come back for the next uh, portion of our session. Thank you.